Hello. Hello. I'm still heating up my lunch. I'll be back in a minute. Good luck. Nice background. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Your cat doesn't like dog. How is it pronounced? Is it Doge? Dog? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's Doge. I'm not sure. Maybe British say Doge. She's wiggly. Say wiggly. Hey, wiggles. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> Okay, guys, if you would put your numbers on. And here's what I'm about to do. Uh, one's here. Two's here. Who's three? It's me. Sanjay, is that you? Oh, Robert, it's you. Okay, three, four is Sanjay, five is Chu, six is Zane, seven's Leah, eight's Brian, nine's Ethan, and ten's Michael. So everybody's here. Okay. All right, let me tell you what I'm about to do. Um, I am about to send you a very private file. <laughs> Nothing weird. Uh, I'm going to send you a private file in Slack, and I would like you, this is incredibly important. Nothing can happen for the rest of the summer unless you do this, okay? Ethan, are you here? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I just got back. Okay, good, good, good. Lee, are you, can you hear me? Leave me out. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I'm going to send you a file. And you don't need to do anything. You don't need to extract this file or anything, but you need to download it. Hold on, let me see. Download it from private chat immediately onto your local machine. And then delete the message. Can you delete the message in private Slack? Please tell me if you can do that. I think you can. Okay, I'm going to send the file I'm sending are RSA encryption keys that are gonna allow you to access the Newton GPU cluster, supercomputer, okay? I'm going to send you, you're gonna be, your student number for the keys will correspond with the number that you have for class, okay? So like, for example, Lee is number one, Tess is number two, Lee or Tess, please tell me if you can actually go on and delete the file. I think I... you have to delete it. Is it me because it's my message? Like I can't delete it from the chat, but I just downloaded it. So you could probably delete it now. Okay. Like yeah, I have perfect. it. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you guys. Make sure you download this immediately because I'm about to download it from chat. De delete it from chat. Okay. Okay. I got it as well. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. For some reason I closed a window and it killed Zoom. So sorry about that. You're frozen. Number four, Sanjay. Uh, 
number five is Chu. How about now? You're unfrozen. All right, sorry about that. I didn't think that would happen. <laughs> Six is Zane. Number seven is Leah. Make sure the file that I send you has, like it says student number, make sure that student number is your number, okay? Leah, you're seven. Um, Brian. Brian, were you here this morning? Yeah, I was here. Man, you're like, you're, man, I didn't even, I'm just so quiet. I didn't even know. Okay, Brian, you're number eight. Um, Ethan, you're number nine. Just download this to your local machine. Don't do anything with it, please. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Just put it on your machine. Okay. Don't do anything. Just download it. Number 10 is Michael, wherever you are here. Okay. Make sure you've downloaded because I'm starting back at number one. And I'm going to start okay. deleting. I don't see where it went on my end. Slack private messages. No, Robert, I think I accidentally sent yours to myself. OK, that makes sense. All right, I got it. Where is it supposed to be? I'm a little confused, sorry. Slack private chat. Or the DMs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Deleting Robert. Deleting Sunjay. I'm, I'm not seeing anything. Are you in our private message? Oh, it's because I didn't press the send button on yours. Ah, there it is. Number five is Chu. Deleting Chu. Chu, you have yours downloaded? Okay, thank you. Chu's deleted. Zane. Zane's deleted. Seven is Leah. Leah. Leah's deleted. Eight is who's eight? Brian. Brian's deleted. Number nine, Ethan. Ethan, you're deleted. Michael, Michael, you got yours? Yeah, I got it. Okay, you're deleted. All right, that's that, okay? Everybody good? Okay, onward and upward, friends. Now, now we move on to, PyTorch. By the way, Brian, I, I did you get your code running and everything? Yeah, I had everything running. Everything's good with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Before we move forward, Lee, will you share your screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I just got this 
environment we created. Excellent. And, Good. Yeah. Let's, okay. Conda activate RE 2021. Okay. Now, um, TensorFlow, you see the tab on your browser? It says TensorFlow. Click on that. Your browser. Oh, tab open on your browser. It says TensorFlow. That's my background. Do you like it? <laughs> oh, so yeah. Come over here. Come over here. Look, this is this is my other daughter. Oh, she looks younger. She's older. Oh, she's definitely older. I see. Yeah, but now she has crutches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, so now copy that first line. Perfect. Conda and so okay, that looks good. Let's do that. Okay. Yes. Ooh, okay. Now go to back to Google. Okay. And do Conda install. Kiras. Maybe not. Yeah, my internet is. Are you frozen? Yeah, it's it's just like going up and off and on and off all the time. Move your cursor real quick. Yeah, we can't see that. Okay. Oh. Yeah, my internet is just off for now, I guess. Okay, go back um, to your uh, go back to your Anaconda prompt. Let's make sure that's still working. Oh, uh, that's paused. Okay, stop stop your share. I the Zoom already turned off itself. Like the internet is gone. Internet's gone. Yeah, it's gone. My computer. <laughs> oh, so are you, you're on your phone then? Yeah, I'm, I'm on, on my phone like you already am using my phone because my phone doesn't go uh, off like that. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Uh, well, once you get that back up, okay. Uh, oh, I got the bank up. Yeah, I got the bank. Okay, good. Okay. So I guess it's finished on here. Let me see. Are you sure about this? Like this doesn't look like it's finished. TensorFlow. Connection failed, TensorFlow base. A simple retry will get you on your way. Yeah, so do, do, do it again. And I guess we'll just wait. Yes. Oh, it's painful. All right. um, yeah, let that run. Stop sharing for a minute. Stop sharing. Okay. And let that run. Let's let your uh, your internet be used for that. Okay. All right. Now. Here's all the hidden secrets of the universe in this in these RSA files. Oh. Which screen are you seeing, by the way? Are you seeing my desktop, uh, my desktop or my browser? Uh, GitHub. GitHub, OK. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to my other GitHub, which is over chunk. Okay. By the way, other than Michael, that's cheating. Does any do you guys know who this is? 
<laughs> Michael, you can't say. Do you guys know who this is? Oh my God, I'm crushed, you guys. I'll, I'll mm. give you guys a hint. He's a comedian. Oh my God. So this this haircut, he's this is Joe Durte. So have you guys ever heard of the movie Joe Dirt? This is a legendary movie. I'm not sure. Joe Dirt. Oh my God, you guys gotta watch this. Okay. It's totally, One totally thing, inappropriate. Okay. What? One thing though is that like I didn't recognize the reference. Yeah. So for the longest time, I actually thought you looked like that. I and I knew that would I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, I was bummed when I saw you. I knew it was gonna happen. I was like, I was like, I bet a bunch of these people aren't gonna know who this is, so they're gonna think this is me. <laughs> I did. Oh my god. Robert, why did you think that was me, bro? That's racist. <laughs> <laughs> that is like typically when people have like their own profile picture, oh it's like god. themselves. So. Last, like, year, last year I was and Tiger I was like, Oh my god. Yeah, I was like, oh, he looks like the dude from Tiger King he's from Florida. <laughs> Maybe it's a common I don't I don't know how they people I don't know people dress over here. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. Oh my god. Oh, it's so funny. I knew you guys, I knew some people would. <laughs> oh, all right, that's enough of that. All right, so if you guys would. Uh, Lee, how are we looking, by the way? It is still going slow as a snail. Snow as a snail? Well, at least it's moving, okay? So as soon as it's done, you let us know, okay? Okay. Okay, all right. So now what I want everybody else to do is go to this link here. Click on this. Okay, and that's, oops, click on this, okay, and that's going to take you here, okay, and what I want you to do, so excluding Chu and Lee, is there anyone else that does not have PyCharm working? I have not tested PyCharm with my current model, but I would believe that it works because it worked with the like when we initially installed it i just haven't tested it with assignment one all right here's what i want you to do go to that link copy this copy this here i mean it's the same i think it's the same as the uh, url but copy this here okay then i want you to open PyCharm. come up here to vcs Is everybody with me? Yeah, I'm just waiting for PyCharm to open. Okay, good. I'll wait a second for that. <clears throat> okay, so it finished, but it seems like some sort of error happened. Share your screen. Okay, um, one second. Um. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. So after everything, it just says warning and could not remove blah, 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 blah. Please remove the file manually. You need to reboot to free file handles. Hmm. Okay, so let's remove it manually. Please remove this file manually. So, okay.
Well, I don't think you need to run it again. Oh, please. I mean, didn't, isn't that what? The issue is like it couldn't fix or like write some files. So I was going to say, if it doesn't need to be done again, it won't. Uh, it won't download everything again. Okay, we'll see. Yeah, it would say it's already satisfied and installed. Okay, Lee, let that keep going. Okay. Stop your share if you would, please. And all right, so everybody else, um, come up here, VCS, get from version control, post it here like that. Okay. And then write clone. Let me see if I already have it though. I don't want to redo it. If actually I'll just do it because you guys are doing it. Where where in VCS do we go? Uh, get from Did, did you see it? Get from version control, I think it says. Mine says get instead of VCS because we enabled that on a previous step. Okay, I got it. Yep. Now, if you will recall, you'll first need to go in and change the interpreter for this project, right? Okay, has everybody been able to get that going? Thumbs down if you have not. Okay. Where are you, Michael? Trying to, trying to find my interpreter, my base interpreter. I guess one quick thing, because this uses PyTorch, we haven't installed PyTorch in the environment yet, so. We'll get there. Okay, just making sure I wasn't missing something. I don't remember the, uh, the interpreter, is that, that's not, I don't remember exactly what that's supposed to be. Share your screen, please. Yeah. Do you see my screen? We can, yeah. So cancel that. Go up to file, settings. Project fourth from the bottom project interpreter drop down Python um, 
of Robert? Actually, no, that's not the, uh, we want the one that has. So click on the, click on the drop down again. This is the one I've been using. That's the one that you installed Kuros and TensorFlow into? Yeah. You're hundred percent sure. Yeah, this is the one I've been using. You didn't use RU 2021? No, I made this environment uh, before okay. our, our RU started. Okay. So that's what I named it. Okay. Okay. As long as that's the environment. Okay. Yeah, this is the one. Okay. All right. Zane, what's up? Oh, nothing. I usually just change my interpreter. I go to the bottom right, just the bottom where it says interpreter. I just click on that and it changes it immediately without going through all those settings. And I'm not sure I see that. Where is that? Bottom right. Bottom right. Do you see that on his screen somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. It had previously no interpreter. It says no Python to play uh, to the left of master. Yeah, that one. Just click on it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, and okay. That must be a new feature. Add interpreter, interpreter setting. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Cool. All right. That's that's everything. I'm up to where you were at. Very good. Very good. All right. Now. Um, if you'll notice on my screen here, let me see. Hold on one second. Okay, Lee, show your screen again. I'm sorry, my internet went off. Okay, so let's so say you can't install in anything. I finished installing the TensorFlow. Okay, then the next thing you're going to install is Canvas. I mean, Canvas. That's right. Oh, great. But you need to Google it first, remember? Don't just, just don't start typing. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Can you show your screen? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Okay, so I just got this one TensorFlow down and I Googled it already. It says... Google. Show me, you show, yeah, show me the Kiros. Yeah, Kiros okay, here. Good, good, good. Yeah, perfect. So okay. I'm going to do this now. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, let that finish. And okay. then tell us when it's done, okay? Okay. It may happen pretty quickly here. Let's see. Oh, how can I stop the sharing? No, no, don't stop yet. Just, just do yes. Okay. Because this may be pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. Okay, now click the up arrow. Actually try, yeah. Yeah, keep doing that until you see that. Remember, we did pip install uh, Python. Yeah, no, keep going. Yeah, that one, that one, that one. Do that one. Don't forget the OpenCV one also. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Just, just hang tight. Okay, now do pip install OpenCV. Don't press enter until I say enter, okay? OpenCV dash contrib, C O N T R I B dash Python. That's it, right, people? You can go to the pip library online to make sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's it. Just press enter. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Now that one's going to take a while, it looks like. So, oh, okay, wait. Yeah, sure. oh, no, 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 never mind, never mind. It's going faster than I thought. Yeah, seems internet is better now. Come on, high speed. <laughs> I thought it, I thought, thought it went, but you're just tricking me. Okay, you can stop the share, okay? Okay. Uh, there should be, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, that maybe that'll let your internet, tell me when that's finished, okay? Okay. All right, now, so you can see here, because I have this requirements text, up here, does everybody see that? Right, that's a part of this little uh, 
repo that I have, you can click on install requirements. I don't know if that works or not. I know that when I tried to do that kind of stuff back in the day with PyCharm, uh, it didn't work out very well. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to hop over here and I'm going to say, um, Okay, they finished. They finished? Yeah. Okay. All right, go ahead and share your screen, please. Yeah, here it is. Okay, all right, that's all good. Now, open up PyCharm. Very good. This is the big moment, people. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay now in the bottom right hand corner thank you to zane see where it says python 3.8 click that go to add interpreter okay. existing environment oh i'm sorry go in the left hand column and click conda yep existing environment oh yeah. wait look it's already there yo it's cool there's a shortcut there oh, i had no please. idea <laughs> okay yep 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 okay now let that update okay see how in the bottom it says discovering binary modules updating skeletons and uh, it's gonna take another time yes okay uh, is the is the make available to all projects necessary it's not necessary oh. no but it does make it easier in the future but that's fine it's fine let's not let's not uh mess anything up here all right let that keep going stop your share Okay, so what we're going to do is come over here. You see, I've activated the uh, the RU twenty twenty one environment. Everybody, so everybody's there with me. Okay, make sure that's good. Now, come over to the internet's conda install PyTorch. PyTorch build 1.8.1, .1, Mac, Conda, Python, CPU. This all looks good. It does this for you, okay? And then here. All right. So you're, you'll each have your own individual commands. Is everybody with me on that? Lee, you need to do the same thing, okay? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, uh, I will check the record lecture later on for the to follow up. Right, so I'm gonna hop over here. Let's try this and see what happens. Now, this could change my NumPy version, so let's keep track of that and see what happens, okay? Could also change my OpenCV. The following packages are the environment is inconsistent. Please check the package plan carefully. The following packages are causing the inconsistency. FFM bag, PyTorch. All right, let's see what happens. Lorelai, you left Buddy in here. Come on, boy. Come on, go out there with Shishi. Is everybody going through the same thing right now? Yeah, mine's still solving environment. No, but can you please move up? I want to see what is the command so I can install it right now. No, 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 no. No? Remember what I said earlier, you always need to Google it for yourself. Oh, okay. And here's why. Are you looking at my screen? Yeah, I'm looking at the screen. 
Okay, look, for me, your OS, Matt. So my commands may be different than yours. Okay. See what I'm saying? PyTorch.org, okay, all right. No, 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 no. <laughs> Always just Google Conda install, whatever you're looking for. Like in this case, Conda install PyTorch, okay? Yeah, I see. Conda install PyTorch. Yeah. So mine finished. Uh, my internet's pretty fast, so I'm gonna close this because I don't wanna see it anymore. Mine finished, so let's see what happens. So I should be able to come over here to main. Did you guys see the red line just disappear? And see down here, it says updating skeletons, cleaning up skeletons in your closet, scanning installed packages. You know, if it's you know, removing skeletons from a closet, they should also say like, you know, adding skeletons to closet, burying dead body, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Full, full package here. Okay, so looks like I'm ready for action. How about you guys? No, no, you need a second to download. Uh, I'm still, still downloading. Still, still downloading. downloading. All right, let's let that happen. Uh, I'm gonna go use the restroom. I'll be right back. Let's just take a fiver, okay? By the way, by the way, has everybody successfully can uh, downloaded and connected to the VPN? I have. I did. Who has not? Um, I haven't done that yet. You have to do it before four o'clock. Okay. Because otherwise you won't be able to do the four o'clock tutorial if you don't do that. I guess I'm going to get my other laptop ready just in case that yeah. one doesn't work. Okay. So it's all set up there. Doge has done it. All right. So go ahead and do that. Uh, if you haven't installed that already, that is the number one priority. And uh, I'll see you back in five. Copy. In five, not at five. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Ethan, for clarifying that. <laughs> so your mileage may vary, but in the past, I've had mixed results with getting PyTorch to use more than one thread on my CPU. So it's uh, you kind of have to fight with it. It's a little weird. If you're on Windows, if you're on Mac or Linux, you're probably fine. Yeah, PyTorch is still using my CPU for some reason, not my GPU. Yeah, no, it's it's weird. You have to... I'll have to go back in my... There's like a notebook I have where I got it to work, and I'll have to see what I did. Um, actually, what the heck? Let's just do that now. For the people who have Windows, did you guys get like CUDA? Yeah, because like you need CUDA Toolkit, and that should have came with... Um, What's it called? Uh, TensorFlow. And I guess make sure that you have the right version of it. Let's see. Let me see. If... I mean, it chose 10.2. Hmm. Is this using PyTorch? Yes, that is using PyTorch. Okay. I wish I had an NVIDIA GPU now.
did anyone else get a pie charm message that like package requirements are not satisfied yeah um that's where, kind of what we're working on right now oh, okay like it's not like a full-on warning so i don't know yeah does it still run if you try it hey has anyone like no idea has anyone activated or cleared a virtual environment from my yaml file from uh, that white mouth no. that's not the first yeah like i don't think you need to create a virtual environment because we already did and we're just gonna yeah work. Oh. yeah what i did i just closed that and then switched to the um the ru 2021 environment yeah. and it, it got rid of the message Oh, am I not in all of this in 21? Oh, okay. Like, I still have that warning about the program runs. All right, so now I'm actually downloading and extracting. So. I, I failed the repo data.json. I usually don't fail that. Holy crap, PyTorch is huge. How big is it? Uh, almost a gig. Oh, man. Why? Like, we're using. Oh, my goodness. Like PyTorch 181, right? Yeah. Show enough. That is the biggest Python package I've ever seen. Thought I made some space on my SSD recently because I was getting low on space. Who has success successfully downloaded it? I think I did, but I have an issue in PyCharm. It says like package requirements are not satisfied for yeah, like, Torch, NumPy, and Pillow, and Torch Vision. Yeah, that's because of the requirements text. Click on the requirements text. Oh, okay. And then it, you should you should be able to say ignore requirements, right? Yeah. Should I just click that? Yeah, just click that. Oh, okay. Then go to the data file like this. Click on that and see if any of these things are red lines. They should not be, but. Tess, are they? No, yeah, I'm all good. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. Everybody else is still downloading? Um, yep. still yeah, it might take me forever. Okay. Does a red folder mean anything in the um like projects directory? A red folder? Yeah. Show us. Oh, let me guess, because like you enabled a uh, GitHub version control. Yeah. 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 It happened to me. If you commit it to the GitHub repo, it would become not red. It would change to like. Is it something I should be worried about? No. Yeah, but mine's not red, and I got because, I got the Git commands. Uh, maybe because you own it. Oh. Maybe because I own it. Virtual oh, no. environment. My environment config. Hmm, interesting. Who knows? Why do you have a VN? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I don't have one. I don't have one. It, it only happens to me when I add a new file to a GitHub repo and I don't commit it. That's where I get the red file. Hmm. Well, for the time being, Brian, I wouldn't worry too much about it, okay? Okay. I mean, if, if, if it does, in fact, have to do with GitHub... Then it most likely. Uh, but. So if it does have to do with GitHub, it probably just is actually providing that environment for other people to use with the with the repo. But anyways, all right, let's jump into this. So while you guys are downloading the torch, okay. Um, let me start going through this PyTorch code, okay? Okay. 
couple things. First of all, typically when you break up your import statements, you're gonna break them up like this. Um, any packages that don't have to do with PyTorch or if you were using Kiros. Then there's gonna be a little category for everything that has to do with PyTorch, okay? And then there's gonna be a category for all of the files that you're gonna import from your personal stuff. Is everybody cool with this, right? Those are, that's kind of how you break things up. Now I've talked to you before, notice here how I have a main file. I have a file for my model that's here, okay? And I have a file for the data that's here. Now, let me say this. This is for um, CIFAR 10 here, okay? PyTorch will import CIFAR 10 for you automatically, just like Kiros did. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so check this out. Here, train set, torchvision.datasets.cfar10. Does everybody see this? So it's the same thing that happened in Kiros. Now, let me say this. Then why do I have a data file here? All I did was I went into, check this out. Excuse me, cut the hiccups. What I did was, is I, is I right clicked, you can right click in, um, uh, in PyCharm. You can right click, go to, declaration or usages. This has changed since the last couple of versions, okay? <coughs> And do you see what popped up here? Transforms.py. Does everybody see that? Okay. What that means is, is that if you click on something, you can click on it and go to the source code of that library, right? So what I did, do you see how I have train set equals CFAR 10 here? All I did was, is I imported it like they have it here and then I right clicked on it. I went to the source code and I copied the source code into this data file so that you guys can start to get an idea of how things are structured. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, the code in this directory is directly copied from the source code that comes from PyTorch, right? This is the source code, but I just put it into my personal data file so that you guys can start to see how things get imported because in a week or two, you're not gonna be using toy data sets from PyTorch or whatever. So I wanted to make sure that you have a structure so you can come over here to this data file and say, okay, I'm not using CFAR 10 anymore. Now I'm using data set XYZ, that's what mine's called. And so you can start to edit these things so you have all that structure already. Does that make sense everybody? Okay, so my point is this, if you want, you can do CFAR 10 from PyTorch directly. Just know you have this nice little format so you can see how everything's broken up, okay? All right, now. Um, okay. So here, here's how I like to break up my code. First, I'm gonna have a section up here for initializing my parameters, okay? Everybody cool with that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an exit, exit statement here and I'm going to run this to that point so you can start to see what it looks like. Okay. Does everybody see what this looks like? Isn't that beautiful? See, it tells you what time your experiment has started. What's the date? These are all things that I've personally added in that you can take to all of your future projects. Okay. Okay. It's going to tell you what time you started. It's going to say, hey, I'm initializing parameters. I like it to print these little things. So I kind of know what's happening at each stage of the game, okay? 
Like for example, when you're debugging your code, um, it'll help you know, oh, I made it to my optimizer section, but something broke there. Okay, does that make sense? Now, let me say this as well. I also have all of my hyperparameters printed out right here, okay? Why do I do that? Sunjay, this is for you. Why do I put my hyperparameters like this here in my output result? <laughs> So that, <laughs> oh, I didn't realize I was, I was mute. <laughs> uh, if I just take a guess, it's to better keep track of sort of what's the you... run that you're doing. I knew I could count on you. That's exactly right, right? Because this is science and we got to keep track of that stuff, right? So I'm going to keep track. I need to know my batch size was this. My learning rate was this. So that when you come back to try something else, you can say, oh, on Tuesday, I tried this experiment. My learning rate was this. My results weren't great. So blah, blah, blah. Is everybody cool with that so far? Now, when you run this on the GPU cluster, all of this stuff is going to get saved to a text file or a log file. OK, so then you're going to have this output to look at later. OK, now what's next? Data. Time to prepare my data, OK? So let's take this, get rid of it, OK? My data section, OK? Print, preparing data. That's going to tell us that, OK? Now here's this, mean and standard deviation. These things are calculated in advance by other people. These things were calculated in advance by other people. In the event that you come across a data set during your time here or at some point in the future, but main, mainly during the summer, and you have a data set that you don't know the mean and standard deviation for, talk to your graduate student about how to calculate those things. Okay, there's different ways to do it, but um, the point is, is that now that we have the mean and standard deviation, we can normalize the data. Okay, or in this case, I guess you'd say standardize, right? So here's what's, what we're looking at, transform, train. So the transformations that I want to perform on my training data, that's what this is, transform, train. Transform my training data, okay? It's coming from the transforms package. I'm gonna write compose here because compose, I'm gonna put a bunch of different things together, okay? Now, this first thing here, Transforms, use a random crop, take a random crop of a 32 square somewhere inside that image, okay? This helps to generalize training. So let's say, for example, if you look at, well, on my screen at least, um, just imagine you have a rectangular image that looks like this, okay? Each time you train with one of those images, you're going to randomly crop out a square somewhere inside of that image. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? Okay. You're going to randomly crop out a square from that image. The reason we're going to do that is because it's going to prevent, um, it's going to encourage generalization and prevents probably overfitting by considering different parts of the image along the way. So for example, you know, this time, if you look at our random crop, it has the head and legs of the cat, front two legs, but maybe not the back two and the tail. Next time, we're going to get the back two legs and the tail. Does that make sense to everyone? So by randomly cropping, it helps to encourage ram randomization. I mean, generalization. Okay. Transforms random horizontal flip. Okay. We're going to horizontally flip our images. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna help again to generalize because imagine in our data set, all of the cats, like see how Doge is in my picture right now? Okay. Imagine all of the dogs in our data set are facing this direction. And then in the test set, you get the exact same image, but Doge is over here now facing the other direction, okay? That's gonna cause problems. So by randomly, flipping our images, we're encouraging generalization from different viewpoints. Does that make sense? 
Go ahead. Wouldn't the horizontal flip flip it upside down rather than to the side? Horizontal flip. Vertical would be like this. If if horizontal is the axis in which it flips, then it but either way, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you may you may be right. You may be right. Uh, but either way, it doesn't matter. The point is is that by flipping the images, you're encouraging. I mean, for example, I've seen people just do it all the way around. That way, uh, the only reason I'm saying it the way I'm saying it is because you're not. I wouldn't expect to find upside down dog pictures. That's very unlikely but I would expect to find dog pictures that are flipped over like this. That's the only reason I intuitively would assume it works that way. But uh, go ahead, whoever said something. Oh, so for the random crop, um, yeah. what, what is the padding part for? Uh, I would assume it probably just pads the outer size of your image with four additional pixels and then randomly crops somewhere around there. Probably something like that. Okay, and in each iteration, it doesn't crop the same part. It crops always different parts. Every time it's going to be different. It's randomly going to happen every time. It's randomly going to choose an X and a Y value, and then that's where it's going to start cropping from. Okay. These aren't things you need to worry too, too much about. They're just, the, the idea is more important. Like, for example, here, if you really want to know, you can hover over this, okay? Pad, pad if needed, pad it. It will pad the image if smaller than the desired size to avoid raising an exception. So there's the answer to your question, Chu. Right. Since cropping is done after padding, the padding seems to be done at a random offset. Okay. Yeah, this is a nice feature that they have now. It didn't used to give these detailed sub, uh, descriptions when you hovered, but now they do, and that's very nice, these doc strings. All right, now transforms to tensor, okay? This is gonna take our final output and it's gonna transform it to a tensor. Tensor is something that GPUs can act on, okay? All right, that's all I need to know about that. And then here, transform, we're gonna normalize our data set with the given mean and standard deviation, all right? Um, quick question about that. Uh, the the three, um, so for the mean and standard deviation, those are for each of the three channels? Channels, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can check here. Let's see if we hover. Normalize a tensor image with mean and standard deviation. This transform does not support pill images. Given a mean, see mean one, mean two, n, for n channels, right? This transform will normalize each channel of the input portions or blah, blah, blah. Okay, is everybody good with that? Now, it used to be like, for example, in PyCharm, if you wanted to know that description, you had to go to the PyTorch documentation, okay? This is, in, in my opinion, incredibly nice that you can just hover and it tells you this, right? All right, so. So these are the transforms that I'm going to perform on my training set, all right? Now, let's instantiate our training set. CFAR 10, where is it coming from? Root data path, train is equal to true, download is equal to true, transform is equal to transform train, okay? Now, as I said before, this CFAR 10 calls on the data package the data file, which uses CFAR 10 here, okay? As I said before, this is directly from the source code of PyTorch. All I did was copy and paste it here, but I copied and pasted it so you can start to get an idea, because I don't want you, you know how the curious code right now, you just import the data set. Imagine you show up on your project to work with your graduate student and you don't even know where the data comes from or how to put data into your file. You see what I'm saying? You can't, this is, you can't be amateur hour, you know? So I want you to have at least a little bit of an idea of uh, what's going on here. Now, inside of this, you'll notice, see how I have data.data .data set? So this is going to inherit the data set class from PyTorch. You always have to do this. This is going to inherit 
the data set module from PyTorch, okay? So whatever that has, we're going to inherit those things, those methods, those attributes, all that stuff, okay? Okay. Now let's take a look. These are just strings defined to tell us where to download the stuff from, okay? Nothing fancy here, right? Remember, because we had a class, the first function is going to be in it or initialize, right? So initialize, we're going to initialize our class, the arguments it's going to take. Of course, we showed self, we talked about that before. Root is the root path of where you're going to find it, right? Train true. Th this means that it's not saying that I want, I want, I'm passing, I'm not passing an argument. I'm defining the argument, what needs to go here. And when I say train equals true, that means the default argument is true. So if in my data class here, here, do you guys see how I wrote train equals true right here? Did I have to write that? No, because you already have that as the default. That's exactly right. So if you look at my data file, because I wrote train equals true as the default, I don't actually have to include that there, but I write it for clarity. Okay. Oh, hold on, I just got an email. Okay, transform, none, target transform, none, download, false. These are the defaults, okay? I've just defined the defaults. Here, self.root. By saying self.root, that means I pass this attribute to the class. This attribute now belongs to the object. Everybody with me there? Okay. OS means operating system. I'm going to use the dot path class from that library. Dot expand user of the root. Okay, we can talk more about that later. But this in general is going to be a very popular package that you'll use a lot of. Okay. Transform, blah, 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 blah. Okay. If download, download, blah, 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 blah. You can ignore this. Um, I don't want to go into this too much, but I do want to say, do you guys see this one? OS.path.join. This is an important one. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to take whatever's here, this string, and it's going to add it to this string, and it's going to add it to this string, okay? So now all those strings get added together, and it becomes a path, okay? So everybody cool with that? Oh, so it's like self.root slash self.base underscore folder slash f? Plus, string plus. Oh, so it's just concatenation. We're not actually like correct, static. correct. It returns it as a path, which really you can do is just strings, but by making it a path, it ensures that uh, the slashes get put where they're supposed to. Okay. Because otherwise you would actually have to say plus string forward slash plus. Okay. Uh, I think that's about all I want to talk about that. Okay. So Here's what you need to know. Every class in Python is going to have the init file. I mean, the init method, right? That's the first one you're going to see inside of the class. Everybody cool with that? Okay, we've talked about that. Now, when we inherited the PyTorch data dot data set here, that means that you have to have certain methods that come. That means we inherit certain methods that come from that class, one of which is called get item here. You know, okay, get item. All right. The two, here, the two methods that you must include in a PyTorch data set class because we inherited the data dot data set, right? The two methods that you must include outside of in it because that's in everything. You must include get item, which is what's going to send your data back to the main. Okay, that's one of them, get item. 
And the second one is the, the length, okay? Length is going to define the length of your data set. Get item is actually going to get the item from the data set, process it however you say to process it here and return it. This index here has to do with batch size, okay? So for example, if you have a thousand images and your batch size is hundred, your index is gonna go zero through nine. Is everybody cool with that? This index goes over the batches of your data set, all right? Or it may actually go elements. I can't remember, but we'll, we'll figure that out more in a minute. I mean, it doesn't really apply here yet, okay? Now, here's, here's two things you need to do. So what I've just done here is I've instantiated my train set, okay? Now my train set, my training data set is an object. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send that data set into my train loader. So this is my data set. This is my data loader, right? What this means is it's going to, okay. And you can pretty much look at the arguments here. First of all, take the data set, break it into batches. Do you want to shuffle them? That's always true in the case of training and testing, you don't need to shuffle. Why do I shuffle? To ensure that you're training on like all the classes and not just like, oh, we're gonna train just on airplanes or something. Uh, kind of, kind of. Um, it's, I would say it's more because we wanna make sure that the batches that we are getting are randomly distributed every time we run a new epoch. That's what I was kind of trying to hint at, but I, I get yeah. yeah, what Ethan said, but then what I said. <laughs> All right, number of workers has to do with the threads for the um, CPU or GPU that you're working on, okay? Um, usually this can be two, anywhere up to four, all right, in my experience. Now, train size is just a value. See how I have train size on here? Number of training samples, train size. Train size is just the length of my training set. You see how I have this underscore underscore length? That's because this is one of the uh, inherited methods in my data set. Remember there were two, I said get item was one, length was the other, okay? Now. Um, could you just put it in like length and then put train set in parentheses? I think so, I think that works fine. Okay. Yeah. I can't remember to tell you the truth. I mean, for some reason I'm doing it this way. I can't remember if it's because I thought it looked prettier or because of there was some actual reason. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're interested, you can try it when you're on the code, but I think that works. Um, but it may not, I don't know. Can't remember. So here, when we go to transform test, transforms.compose. So you'll notice that I'm keep, see how I have train data, test data, right? Notice transform train, transform test, train set, test set, train loader, test loader, right? Do you see how I'm paralleling my code here? I want everything to be, and it's nice. So all the training stuff kind of goes together. Then I do one space, all the test stuff goes together, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing this on with a very specific purpose because I want my code to be readable for me later when I go to look at it, right? And I don't want to have to have tons of comments everywhere so it gets annoying. So I try to keep it organized in this way. Now, we are going to need to send our testing samples to tensors so that our GPU can work on them. We are going to normalize them, but we no longer need to randomly horizontally flip, whatever, and we no longer need to randomly crop. And the reason was is because we were doing those things to encourage generalization in our model. Well, these images don't train our model at all. These are testing images. So we don't need to encourage generalization with those, okay? Test set CFAR10, same data path, right? This is a root data path that I'm using. False, download true, transform, transforms test, okay? Test loader, uh, 
Here I actually break it into an e a number divisible by the actual images. Shuffle, false. Now this is kind of important. You don't need to shuffle. And if you think about it, it would make it, you guys could figure it out. But I just want to I want to show you shuffle true, shuffle false. You don't need to shuffle the testing images, right? We're shuffling the training images because we want them to randomly come to us in batches, random groups to encourage generalization with our model. We don't want it to see the same things in the same order every single time. But when you're testing, it doesn't matter what order they're coming in, right? You're just gonna test on each individual image and it's gonna produce an output, true or false, whatever. Number of workers, same thing, okay? So now let's go to this point. Any questions so far? Okay. Preparing data, number of train samples, 50,000. Number of test samples, 10,000. Number of classes is 10, right? I like to do this because um, so any, anyways, like for example, the experiment that you guys did with assignment one, right? This is exactly why I do that kind of thing, because the number of training samples won't always be the same. For example, uh, UCF 101 is a data set comprised of 101 different activities that humans do. Jumping, rope, playing golf, weightlifting, basketball, stuff like that, okay? Well, of the 101 classes of activities, only 51 have audio. Only 51 of the classes have audio. So, for example, number of classes, if I'm operating on the audio, that could be important for me to know, oh, I was number of classes, 51. Oh, yeah, that's an audio thing. Number of samples, you see what I'm saying? So this is all, it's science. We're keeping track of this stuff here, okay? Okay. Now, building model. So here, net equals VGG model name, then I'm going to send my model to a device. All right, so let's go back up to the top and check out what device is, okay? This will always be pretty much a part of your code. Device is equal to CUDA if CUDA, Barracuda. All right, CUDA if Torch CUDA is available, in other words, if there's a GPU available, use it. Otherwise, use the CPU. Is everybody cool with that? Okay. Remember how I told you that in PyTorch, it automatically will determine if you're using the GPU or the CPU, right? This is where that's happening. So you don't have to download TensorFlow dash GPU and all that mess. Okay. So, um, so let's go back down here. So, I'm going to instantiate my model and I'm going to send my model to the device, either CPU or the GPU, whatever I'm using. Okay. So now we're going to exit here. See what happens. Notice this time, see how there's no preparing data and we didn't download the data this time? It's because I already downloaded it, right? Preparing data, building model. VGG 16 model successfully built. Well, wait a minute. Where is that? I don't see it here, right? It's not here, okay? That's because it's in my model file. So let's go take a look at that. Which one am I using here? See what I have here? Print string model successfully built with whatever self.vgg name is, okay? Now let's take a deeper look at what this is all about. Which one am I using? That's VGG 16. I just used, so look at this VGG here, okay? So let's come over here. It's not this one, because this one says VGG 16. Everybody cool with that? So let's go back up here and take a look. This is the class I'm using. Notice, Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Notice that model 
takes in a parameter in addition to self, okay? VGG takes in, a, in an argument of VGG name, okay? Well, what is VGG name? Let's come back here, look at the parameter, model name. So let's go back up to the top, model name here. See, I've defined model name as a parameter up top, so I don't have to hard code it, right? Everybody see how this says VGG 16 here? All right. So in other words, this turns out to be VGG 16. So super here, um, the super class, uh, I don't want to go into that right now. Okay, let's not talk about that right now. But basically it's just inheriting from the neural network module here, okay? Um, so here I'm gonna add the attribute to this class of VGG name, so I can pass that around as self VGG name now, right? So for those of you unfamiliar with how this works, when I say self dot VGG name equals VGG name, this is how it happens. Whatever I put here in my model, gets passed to right here, and that gets passed to self.vgg name. So now anywhere inside of this model, I can use self.vgg name, like here, self.vgg name. That's the, the, the variable that gets passed to my class. Does that make sense to everybody? It's called the attribute, okay? All right, self.features is equal to self make layers well what is make layers see when i highlight it here see how it gets highlighted down here okay make layers make layers okay cfg well what's cfg i don't know we'll take a look in a minute vgg name vgg name is vgg 16 so let's go up here vgg 16 goes into the dictionary config and that tells me these parameters 64 64 m 128, 128M, 256, 256, 256M. All right, does everybody see that? Right? And what that does is when it gets passed to this make layers function, config gets passed here, okay? It builds the appropriate number of layers. So notice here, if X is equal to M, do a max pool. Otherwise, do a conf2D. Right, so let's go up and take a look at what that means. So that means we're gonna do conf2d, conf2d, max pool. Conf2d, conf2d, max pool. Now, Ethan, this is kind of interesting based on what you were saying earlier. Uh, remember how you were talking about, you were trying the different number of layers and I think you said you did two and then you tried three, but it went back down. Right, yeah. Well, I think this is kind of interesting because they do do two and then they do two again, but then they do three. Ooh. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so you could like do two, two, three, three, three. So you can mix it up, right? So I thought that was kind of interesting here. All right. So it's going to end up building this model for us, right? So it's going to put in a max pool for that, and it's going to put in a conv 2D otherwise. And notice that it's putting in a conv block. Like I like to call them a block. It's going to put a conv 2D convolution. It's going to put in a batch normalization. And it's going to put in a ReLU for each time you have a convolution. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So every time you have one of those convolutions, it's going to do boom, boom, boom. It's going to put all this stuff in there. Okay. Layers plus equals at the end, right? So you're defining this thing. It's interesting. Notice you're defining this as a list, right? And then you're going to say layers plus is equal to, right? We talked about that name an average pool at the end. You're gonna do an average pooling at the end, okay? And then you're gonna return, this is a sequential model with the layers. The star here has to do with what's called a keyword or args and quarks, okay? When you put the star here and then you put something after it, okay? Everybody listening? Because the star thing really confused me. The star thing means you don't know exactly how many things are gonna come next. It leaves, it leaves it open to variation. Why would we wanna leave it open to variation? Because it could be this many things, it could be this many things, it could be this many things, or it could be this many things. 
depending on how the user defines this thing. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So basically, if we say star X, we're saying that X has a variable length. Yeah, yes. You okay. don't know exactly how many pieces are going to come in that puzzle. Okay. Now, that this is a very, very, very fancy way of defining this. Okay. And I don't expect any of you to do it this way. But so I added this guy down here. And I think I told you this before. I added this down here so that you can see that that VGG16 model that we just built is literally equivalent to this. Okay. All right. Self. So I do a convolution, conv 2D. I do a batch norm. I do a convolution. I do a batch norm. And you're like, oh, where's the ReLU? I don't know where it is. Maybe I put it in here somewhere. Don't worry about that for now. Okay. But the point is, is that, do you see how I've written it all out here, right? Honestly, it's so much easier to read this way. We all know that, okay? Um, Self.relu. It's interesting that I don't put it in there. Oh, I'm so dumb. <laughs> Duh, amateur hour. So you see here how I'm defining? Okay, so in this class, the first thing I do is I have my initialized function. And in my initialized function, I'm adding method, I mean, excuse me, attributes to that class, that object, okay? Conv1a is now one of them. Conv1a bn is now one of them. Conv1b, conv blah, 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 blah. But then, since I use this neural network module, I've inherited that class. I must use the function called define forward. And what forward does is basically, Remember how the functional looked for Kiros? I basically, whatever I put into this, so this is an image when I put it in, I put the image in here. Then the image gets convolved. Then it gets convolved again. Then I do a rectified linear unit, okay? I'm sorry, not convolved again. It gets a, a batch normalization. So I, get, I do a convolution here. I do a batch normalization here, BN. I do a rectified linear unit here, I get X. Then I take X and I put it into this step. X gets convolved, gets batch normalized, gets rectified linear unit, and I get X. Then I take that X and I put it in here. That gets pooled. Does everybody understand what I'm saying with this? Questions? Okay. So I guess if you were a masochist, you can make this a one-liner, basically. Like, because we're you, just taking- You could, yeah, mm -hmm. you could. Doing that, yeah. So now, some of the benefits personally of writing out your code like this, okay? Let's say, for example, you wanted to examine the features at a certain point along this path, right? Let's say you wanted to print them right here to get an idea of their length. Let's say, for example, you wanted to do this, you know, print x dot shape, okay? Now you can do that. You can do that here. Whereas up top, where we use the function to, to build all that business, it doesn't lend itself to printing after a specific layer, right? I mean, you could put an if statement here that said, you know, whatever, whatever. But I mean, in this way, it's easier to read. I mean, honestly, this is, this, it's almost obnoxious, honestly. It's almost obnoxious. I mean, it looks so pro, but it's not good for even yourself and it's not good for other people if they wanted to read your model. This is the easiest way to read it, you know? But at some point you have to imagine like, for example, with ResNet or other things, I mean, imagine you have 128 layers. You're not gonna do it this way. You know what I mean? That's obnoxious. So here, uh, print this, okay? Then, so, so when I instantiate that object, let's take a look. When I instantiate my model here, and then I send it to my device, okay? All I've done is go up to this line here, okay? I initialized that object with this function here, okay? I haven't actually used it at all. See how I instantiated it? I initialized it, but I haven't actually used it at all, right? It doesn't get used until I go to my training. So this 
forward business here doesn't actually get called until the model gets used. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, good. Now, just a couple of things. We haven't talked about this yet, but by the way, you'll notice I call my last fully connected layer here classifier, right? That's, um, that's what we talked about already. Now, when you write this step here, this step is what flattens it. Like we had the word flatten in Kiros, this is what does that, okay? And then it's gonna return that 10 by one vector here, okay? Now, in Python, if you wanted to run this code as your main, right? So this, see how it says, if name is equal to main, okay? When I run my main file, when I run this and it calls this file model, right? So if you look up here from model import BGG, right? When I run my main file and it imports model, model is not the main file being run. It is a file being called. Is that clear to everyone? Tess, you good? Wakey, wakey. Okay. So if this, on the other hand, is the file that I'm running. So in other words, if I go like this, run model, if I run this file, then it will be considered main. Does that make sense? So if this is the main file that runs, do these things. So let's take a look what happens if I do this. Okay. So what I've done is I did the same thing. I've defined my device. Here, I instantiate my model as VGG16, and then I print my model here, okay? Now, there is another library that you can use in PyTorch, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, because if you look at this, do you guys see how this is not as clean as that kernel, I mean, as the Kiros version, right? You know how it's got that nice little table when it prints out your model summary? Yeah, that was, that was nice. There is a package that will do it. The only reason I don't include it in this code is because it's not on the cluster. That library is not on the GPU cluster. So you would have to manually install it if you don't want an error. Like if you have import, you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. So like, I guess on our, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I guess we could like add more packages if we wanted to. Of course you can. And you'll, so basically, and this is exactly why I do things the way I do. Remember how I started you with Anaconda? Well, guess what the GPU cluster uses? Anaconda, right? So then we created our own environment. And remember how I told you, hey, don't install packages from PyCharm, install packages from the command line itself. Remember that? Well, that's because when you go to the cluster, there is no PyCharm. You install packages from the command line itself, right? There's a big picture here. So you're gonna use Conda on the cluster, you're going to create your own virtual environments, and then you're going to install packages on there, right? So I wanted to make sure you know how to do all that locally that way. Uh, interesting. It looks like Dr. Shaw just sent you guys an email about having office hours from 4 to 4.30 effective Tuesday until Friday. How is that going to work? Because we're still doing stuff by at 4.30. Well, so your meetings with me and other people, et cetera, that will end early to mid next week, right? And then you're going to go with your advisor, your graduate student advisor, and they're going to, they're going to be the person you meet with when necessary, right? Now, usually I have a meeting around two o'clock where you guys all come in, we'll check in. That'll be like 30 minutes long. We'll do that most days. But other than that, you guys, you know, will only talk to me if you have questions, right? So basically early next week, we're breaking up. It was fun though. So now where was I here? Well, let's see if I have this down here. 
Aha. So now, if you'll recall at the bottom of my model file, see how I have if name equals main. This is something that I have developed over time for myself. Okay, here's how you minimize errors. This is one way I've learned to minimize errors. In your main file, your main's gonna call model, your main's gonna call data, right? So if you're having problems in those files, sure, PyCharm will throw up an error and it will say, hey, you're having a problem in your model, et cetera. But I like to have these little things down here because this allows me to run my model file and determine if that file by itself works okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I also do the same thing in data. Now, I alluded to this before, but I'm always sketchy about whether my data is actually happening, right? Am I accidentally sending in black squares? I don't know. I always get sketched out about that. So what I've done is, at the bottom of my data file here, I've also included if name equals main. That way we can run this one. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna instantiate our, our uh, uh, train and test sets here, just like we do in the main. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna visualize each one of those images. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So let's try this and see if it works. Fingers crossed. Now, if you'll notice, I put some import statements inside of this if statement, right? If name equals main, then import CV2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you see that? Because I don't want to import CV2. Like, let's say I'm on the cluster. Okay, the only, like, let's say I'm on the cluster, right? And CV2 is not, I don't use open CV in my, my directory. I mean, in my con environment. So if I run main, which doesn't import CV2, I don't want to import it if I don't mean to. Do you see what I'm saying? I only want to do that if I'm on my local machine. So that's why I put it inside of this statement here. All right, so let me run this. Let's see what happens. Wants act Zoom Z Outlook plugin agent allowing access to documents and data in PyCharm and form actions within the app. Fine. Okay. So here, right? You guys see how what I've done here? This is the image name. Can you guys see this? I know it's hard to tell what this is. You can kind of tell that's a boat. That's a boat. Yeah. That's a who knows. <laughs> it's supposed to be a jetliner. It looks like a, a brontosaurus to me. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it? Do you guys see that? <laughs> it looks like a, a sheer dinosaur. There's yeah, a frog. This is a frog. Okay, I can see that. Crab pod. What did you call me? <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. I don't know what that is. To tell you the truth, I think it's a. I think it was a frog. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. This is a car, right? Look, you kind of have to squint like this if you want to see it. <laughs> oh yeah. No, really. Uh, that, that's actually so bad. Quick about question about the the, um, the the code that we just downloaded with PyTorch. Yeah. Um, I tried running it and it didn't work. And then I looked on Stack Overflow, and they suggested um, changing the number of workers to zero for some reason. And I did that, and then it worked fine. So uh -huh. I'm not really sure why that would be. No idea. It's very strange. Are you on Windows by any chance? Yeah. Maybe because you don't, you're not running anything on a GPU. I, I really don't know. No, I've had issues in the past with PyTorch. If you tell it to use more than like one or two CPU threads, it's really weird. Interesting. Try one, chew and see what happens. Are you getting a broken well, pipe I, I by any chance? I don't have a GPU, so hmm. I suppose it wouldn't I mean, it, it should... be using anything anyways. Hmm. No, no, it has to do with the number of threads, which, you know, can be available on your CPU or your GPU. Yeah. Uh, are you getting a broken pipe error by any chance? Yeah, that's what I was getting before. But then after I changed it to zero, it uh, didn't give an error anymore. Yeah, you're, I have, I'm yet to find a resolution for that other than switching to Linux. So, so here's a couple of things. If you find the resolution of that, please tell me. <laughs> here's what I want you to know. 
four batch index inputs targeted on envelope here. Okay. And see how I'm using the test loader. You can change this to train loader if you'd like. Here, there's a lot of stuff happening here and you don't need to know what all of this is, but I'm going to tell you what I do from here to here is I undo all of those transforms that we did in the main file. Do you remember that? Train loader and test loader do trans certain transforms to my images. Like for example, think about the mean and the median, right? Or the mean and the uh, standard deviation, right? If I apply those to the images, how are they gonna look right? I don't want them normalized when I'm trying to visualize. I want them how they came to me originally. So all of this stuff is me undoing those things here. See, multiplying by 255, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you don't need to know all that. But what I do want you to know is that there are some nice little one-liners in here that you can take away and use. For example, how do I resize an open CV? CV2 resize, boom, okay? How do I, um, here I have a named window. How do I resize the window? So those images, pictures that you were seeing, right? Well, they're 32 by 32. I assure you, you wouldn't be able to see them unless I did 30, 300 by 300. This will allow you to move that window. Everybody see what I'm saying? So you don't need to go through all this stuff if you don't want, but the point is, is what I'm doing is I undo all that and I have that all down here. So it's never gonna get run unless you run this file specifically. I've never seen other people do it this way. This is what I have found to be best for myself. Uh, I like to be able to run my model and my data files individually to see if they're working because I get really sketched out about whether, you know, I'm seeing data or not. And this tells me, okay, I'm, I can be pretty sure that this is data is actually going to my model. Okay. You, I mean, you saw the pictures, right? So um, I think we're going to cut it off here because I have to go meet Dr. Shaw and Dr. Lobo, but I will see you at four o'clock in our meeting with Jamie where we do the uh, cluster tutorial. Okay. Make sure you is have, cool have if I, Is it cool if I ask a question real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So one thing I've, I've been considering is that uh, when you're actually working on the GPU, you're going to want to have your, your model and all your code working like absolutely 100% perfect before you even try to, to put it on the, the, the GPU. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So what do I do to solve that problem? Well, you may be able to say, hey, how can I run this code on my local machine? Because I don't actually have that data set on my local machine. One of the options is, like here at the bottom of your data file, you can create just gibberish data set of the same size, same dimension, same number of channels, et cetera, right? Use numpy.random.whatever to create a gibberish data set that's of the same size as the data that you'll be using, same number of classes, you can do all that. You don't have to create, like for example, let's say um, you know, you're looking at CIFAR 10, right? And it has 50,000 images in the train set. You don't need 50,000 images on your local machine to make sure that your code is working properly. You need like five or 10 from each class. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes what I'll even do is I will Is it even on this machine? Yeah, here it is. Nice. I saw your mug shot. Yeah, good thing it only showed the top half because it's a full length picture, but I was wearing a shirt. <laughs> So you can see here, like for example, UCF 101, okay? I don't have the whole UCF 101 video here, okay? But what I do have, like for example, UCF 10, right? Sometimes I use like a subset of the data set just to see if my code's working or um, miscellaneous, let's see, I think, see like, see how I sample vids, here you go, right? I just download some from a couple classes so I can just test stuff on my local machine. You don't need the whole data set. You may have to write a couple extra lines to make it accommodate, you know, less classes or whatever. But so usually what I'll do is you want to make sure your code's running locally. 
and then you can submit it, right? So that's not always true, but that's the idea. All right, so we're gonna cut it off here. We'll pick up tomorrow with the rest of this stuff. Um, get this code running on your local, okay? All right, I will see you guys tomorrow, okay? Or I'll see you at four, sorry. Okay, all right, ciao.